Dr. Linda Porter joins me again, and this time we talk about not one, but two queens, Madeline of Valois and Marie of Guise. These two women were the wives of James V of Scotland. And you know James V as the father of Mary, Queen of Scots. So sit back and enjoy this episode with Dr. Porter. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. You're listening to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast with Rebecca Larson. Dr. Porter, welcome back. Thank you, Rebecca. Today we have a really fun topic to talk about, and it's not very frequently that I have two people to talk about during a show. So we're going to do our best to stay on track and not favor one over the other. But to kind of set the stage for our topic today, let's go back in time to Margaret Tudor. She was the daughter of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. She married King James IV of Scotland in 1503, and it had been almost 80 years since a Scottish king had an English bride. The last was Joan Beaufort, granddaughter of John of Gaunt and Catherine Swinford. And before that, I believe it was Joan in 1328, daughter of Edward II and Isabella of France. Am I on the right track, Linda? Yeah, yeah, that, that is right. I mean, it wasn't, as you can tell, it wasn't unheard of for English princesses or noble women to marry into the Scottish royal family, but it was fairly unusual. And the Scottish kings tended um, to to marry um, abroad, as did English kings at the time, and mostly either into Scandinavian royal families because of the proximity geographically, and and um, also you know there were quite strong familial links by that time, or possibly into France, and, and occasionally they did marry um, actual Scottish noble women as well, but that wasn't so common. Well, what I was attempting to do was to prove exactly what you said. It wasn't as common as one might think that these geographical neighbors would join their forces in an alliance. Dr. Porter, before we explore Madeline and Marie, what was the significance of the old alliance and what role did it play in James V's choice for a bride? Well, the old alliance was the um, very long-standing diplomatic uh, uh, arrangements and, and treaties between France and Scotland, who were natural allies, really, um, because both uh, had something to gain from it in their dealings with the English. Um, from the French perspective, it it could help them act as a kind of annoyance to the English. And from the, um, the Scottish per- perspective, the French gave them uh, a fair degree of protection as well as as you know greater standing in Europe. So it, it was it was a very old alliance. Um, I mean, I, I suppose some people still um, view it as the the most important part of of Scottish diplomacy throughout the Middle Ages and the early modern period. Uh, so it wasn't very surprising that James V, even though he was half a Tudor, uh, would have favoured a French marriage. Uh, and in fact, th- there weren't really many other possibilities. Um, some of his Scandinavian relatives might have been possibilities, but he doesn't seem to have particularly favoured that line. Uh, and his only English relative of, of sort of marriageable age was Princess Mary, uh, the the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. And by the time James reached his majority and was ruling for himself, Mary had, of course, been thrown out of the succession and declared illegitimate um, by the mid-1530s. So she wasn't a terribly attractive prospect. We're looking at France. So let's let's shift our focus completely to France and James's first choice for a bride. Now, he had negotiated with Francis I of France about this. What more can you tell us about those negotiations with his daughter and maybe a little bit of Madeline's place in the family? Well, uh, James's pursuit of a French bride is rather unusual because uh, firstly, he went to France himself, um, uh, which which again was was quite uncommon and shows how 
how um, secure he felt in leaving the government of Scotland at the time, because he was gone for about nine months, in fact. Uh, and initially, um, a contract was drawn up with um, the daughter of the Duke de Vendôme. Uh, and he, James actually went to, to, to see this lady. And we don't know whether perhaps there was something that he, he saw with her or about her that he didn't particularly like. But I think he was always actually angling um, for a, a better marriage and for the, for the hand of the, the French king's daughter. So for whatever reason, this, this first contract came to nothing and was abandoned. And um, James moved on uh, into France, almost sort of in pursuit of his father in or his hopefully his father-in-law, who wasn't in Paris actually at this time. He was he was elsewhere in France. Uh, and and sort of awaited there for, for developments. Um, he wanted Madeleine because she was the elder of two daughters of uh, Francis I and Queen Claude. Uh, she was then in her mid-teens um, and, and already quite sickly, uh, which is interesting. She suffered from TB, uh, at least as far as we can tell. And this was known, um, it was known to James as well as to Francis. It was known that she suffered from recurring ill health and severe attacks of fever from time to time. But I think w with the sort of hopefulness that often comes under those circumstances, particularly in an age in which medicine was not well understood or even well practiced, I think everyone concerned hoped that eventually she would get better. In fact, we know now, of course, that she wasn't going to get better. Uh, but um, James had determined that that he wanted this girl. Um, she had a younger sister, Marguerite, that he wanted Madeleine uh, as, as his bride. Madeleine had two elder brothers, um, only one of whom would eventually survive to become Henry II of France. Uh, and uh, Madeline seems to have been a favourite of, of her father's. He, although totally unfaithful to his wife, he was quite fond of his children. And I, it does seem that Francis had misgivings about letting this delicate girl uh, make a marriage, um, even a, a reasonably prestigious one. And you've got to remember that for the daughter of a French monarch, Scotland isn't necessarily, you know, the, the most prestigious place to marry into. But as Madeline herself seems to have said, um, she would be a queen. And that did have a, a certain cachet, obviously. I think Francis was concerned about how the Scottish climate might affect his, his daughter's health. But um, with a fair amount of cajoling and pressure from James, he, he did um, decide to go ahead with this match, perhaps because he thought it would also annoy Henry VIII, um, which, needless to say, it did very considerably. Uh, and so the, the marriage was arranged. The, the young people met. Um, there is a whole load of sort of uh, fanciful Victoriana and then subsequent historical novelettish stuff about this. That they fell madly in love. There isn't a great deal of evidence for this. I mean, Madeline, uh, already very consumptive, was no great beauty, though she may have had a sort of delicate appearance, I suppose. Um, uh, James was not the most social of young men, um, partly because of his dreadfully difficult upbringing. And he didn't speak very much French. Uh, in fact, his inability to speak French was rather laughed at amongst the, the French nobility. Um, he did sort of settle down and try and learn once the marriage negotiations went ahead. But the, the English ambassadors laughed at the time and said that, you know, if his wife is as silent as he is, it should be a fairly successful marriage because <laughs> neither of them is likely to annoy the other. Uh, but nevertheless, the marriage did go ahead. It took place on the 1st of January 1537 at Notre Dame. Um, Madeline was splendidly dressed on the arm of her father. But James did not take her immediately back to Scotland um, because it was thought that um, given her state of health, a winter voyage and taking up residence there in the winter would probably not be a good idea. That is a great segue because I was really interested in her voyage to Scotland. I didn't realize that they didn't go together. So that's a good little tidbit for the listeners to know that she had stayed behind for a time. When she finally did travel to Scotland, do we know anything about how she managed on the voyage? 
Uh, no, no. She, although she stayed behind, so did James. He didn't go with. He didn't um, go back to Scotland. Um, so uh, she, the voyage was very difficult. Um, they were together, uh, and uh, it, in fact, it was very stormy. Even when it took place in what well, must have been late May, early June, fifteen thirty-seven, and at one point they had to um, uh, sort of put down the anchor in Scarborough off the uh, Yorkshire coast because uh, the sea uh, was too rough for them to continue. But they, they did arrive back at Scotland together and they, uh, um, you know, uh, preparations were made for Madeline to enter, uh, make a formal uh, entry as Queen Consort into Edinburgh. Um, but she was only there seven weeks um, before she died. Uh, it, it was said subsequently that she died in James's arms, but I think that's rather unlikely. Um, royalty tended not to uh, be at, at deathbeds. Uh, it was considered slightly unseemly. Um, but although she had doctors with her, she either because of the difficulties of the voyage or because really her time was just up, uh, she survived um, less than two months in Scotland. Such and almost immediately, James was looking for another bride. It's such a tragic story. It really is. You know, it seems like her father didn't want her to go because she was frail. He let her go anyway, and then she died. I yes, I mean, I, it wasn't, I think, a very good judgment on James's part, to be quite <laughs> frank, um, to to um, pursue the marriage with this delicate young woman. But it, it brought him enormous prestige. Um, however, it left him, you know, a, a widower before he'd had a chance to become a husband. And of course, it, it did beg the question as well, Rebecca, as to, you know, if this woman was so delicate, would she be able to bear him children? And the whole point of marrying was to get an heir, of course. So it is, it, it, it's a kind of I've always thought of it as a rather curious incident. I mean, poor Queen Madeline is is probably one of the most forgotten queen consorts in the British Isles, I should think, because she spent so little time here. She did meet her, her mother-in-law, Margaret Tudor, um, who'd managed to uh, eventually uh, find enough money. She was always terribly strapped for money, Margaret. Um, I think, in fact, Henry VIII had reluctantly provided her with enough money to you know, make sure that she was dressed appropriately to meet her daughter-in-law. But uh, they, they didn't have time to get to know each other. And, and I suppose you could say that James and Madeleine had had time to get to know each other in France. Um, but it's like a lot of these royal marriages. Um, uh, a great deal has been read into it subsequently, particularly of a sort of rather saccharine romantic nature. And we don't really know a great deal about their relationship. Um, they would have shared interests, I think, in, in music and artistic things. I mean, Madeleine was well educated, as you would expect a French princess to have been. And from what little we know about her, she seems to have been a young woman who did know her own mind. And in many respects, knew what she was letting herself in for when she when she went to Scotland. But I think um, the poor girl who was not quite 17 when she died, she was a few months short of her 17th birthday, would have liked to have had longer to try and establish herself uh, as James's queen consort. So you're right. It, it is a very sad story. What language did they share that they could communicate? Eventually, in rather... Um, um, strained and fractured French. I mean, uh, James had been brought up. I um, mean, his education had been badly neglected during the, his long minority for, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and he appears to have not been a very natural linguist, which is unusual since both of his parents were extremely good at languages. Uh, but um, eventually they could communicate in French. I suppose they would both have had some Latin as well. I don't think we know quite how much Latin James actually had. Um, but th they could have communicated in that to some degree as well. What is fairly certain, I think, is that Madeline would have spoken little, if any, English and absolutely no Scots, which would have been quite unfamiliar to her. But of course, like most royal brides coming from a, a different country, she did bring a, a group of servants, uh, ladies and gentlemen with her who uh, spoke her own language and who probably acted as, as, as sort of translators when necessary. I don't know why this is coming into my head, but did she ever go out on hunts with James? 
Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, may maybe um, they might have once or twice, but I don't think her health was good enough for that, even, even in the summer. Um, she would presumably have liked hunting. James liked hunting, certainly. And, and as a French princess, she would have had the opportunities to do this. But I, I think her time was so brief and her health so perilous um, that they didn't really have any opportunity for, for sort of any major sporting activities of that sort. And now a word from our sponsor. With such a short tenure as Queen, did she leave an impact on Scotland at all? Was there enough time for her to do anything no, like that? No, I, I don't really think there was. I mean, I, I don't, Scottish historians don't talk about her very much, actually. Um, I, I, I don't know what current Scottish thinking would be on that amongst my Scottish colleagues up there. But um, I mean, the, the only indirect impact she left was that, that Sir David Lindsay of the Mount, who, who was the court poet, if you like, wrote a rather splendid um, sort of uh, long epic poem about her de death and how very sad this was. And, you know, they, they'd lost this, this sort of brilliant and angelic young woman. Um, so to the degree that she had a minor impact on Scottish literature, then I suppose she did leave something behind. But I think all that she really left behind in James's mind was that he'd been right to pursue a French marriage and that he'd better start fairly speedily looking for a replacement. Yeah, because like all kings, James needed a bride. He needed that alliance. So he again turned to France. And this time, who was he looking for as a bride? Um, I, I think he, I'm not sure whether he had any really sort of specific ideas of his own. He, he sort of put this to, to Francis I, um, asking him, the French king, essentially, to, to find him another bride. Um, whether uh, James had even noticed the lady whose uh, candidacy uh, Francis eventually put forward, um, I, I don't know. He might have done because she was at his wedding with um, Princess Madeleine. Uh, splendidly attired and there with her her husband at the time. But the, the lady that um, Francis I picked for him was um, Marie de Guise, Mary of Guise, the eldest child of a, a prominent family in northeastern France who were very much on the rise politically, but who were not very popular within France, certainly not with the French princes of the blood. Uh, and James uh was perfectly happy uh, with the offer of this lady she was healthy in fact she was recently widowed herself mary of guise had been married in her early 20s she was then a, a woman of nearly 23 she'd been married to um uh, uh to a french nobleman and uh, had, well, in fact, was expecting a son when her husband died unexpectedly. He thought he got chicken pox, but I would think it was more likely that he actually had something like smallpox. Uh, but she, she was the Duchess of Longueville. She was the mother of a, a young son and pregnant with a, another one. Um, uh, and she had not long given birth um, to her second son when um, she was told that she was to marry James V of, uh, of Scotland. Uh, and not surprisingly, she was considerably less than thrilled with this uh, at the time. <laughs> she didn't want to leave her elder son. Um, the younger son sadly died um, within a few months of his birth, so that um, within the space of a year, um, Mary of Guise had lost her first husband and her, her younger son, and was also being told that she had to uproot and leave behind her child and everything that she had known uh, to become a, a queen in Scotland. Uh, there was a considerable delay before she went across because her father, um, Claude of Guise, was unwilling to provide a dowry. Uh, I've never been entirely sure why this was. Um, perhaps he just was fairly strapped for money. Uh, but it, eventually Francis was prevailed upon to provide a part of the dowry. He may have wanted Marie in Scotland to sort of balance in a way um, the power of, of an unpopularity of the Guise in France, because uh, at least their elder child and their, their eldest daughter would be out of the way in, a, in another country. 
Uh, and uh, anyhow, this marriage was arranged. Uh, Marie was a very reluctant bride, um, but but she had no choice. You know, it, it was the lot of, of royal and noble women in these days that if you were told that you were going to marry someone, um, then you had to. Um, you could protest and make a fuss all you liked. But I think it says something for Marie's intelligence that she obviously decided that there was no future in making a fuss. And eventually she set out um, in the autumn of 1537 with her father and her sister Louise uh, to take ship to Scotland. Uh, she had a less perilous voyage than her hapless predecessor, Madeleine. Um, though she didn't land precisely where she was expected. You, you may recall that, of course, voyages by ship in those days were a bit of a lottery as to where the winds and the tides and the weather might take you. Uh, Catherine of Aragon, of course, when she came to marry Prince Arthur, was not expected to land at Plymouth, and that caused quite a stir when she did. Well, um, uh, presumably, um, Marie de Guise would have been expected to land at, at, at um, Edinburgh's Harbour, at least, but she actually landed further up the coast in Fife at Crail. Uh, and uh, eventually, well, James and his courtiers were waiting, and he met her, uh, and they were married at, at St Andrew's uh, Cathedral, um, which was the, the most important you know, religious establishment in Scotland. Uh, and this... Um, handsome rather than beautiful. I mean, she was quite a good looking woman, uh, Mary of Guise. And of course, she was healthy uh, and had proved her ability to produce sons. Um, so she was, in many respects, a much more sensible choice than the, the fragile princess who, who wasted away in Scotland within two months of arriving there. So uh, Marie arrived and settled down to her new life. One of our listeners um, by the name of Sophie wanted me to ask you whether or not she learned Gaelic. No, she wouldn't have learned any Gaelic. In fact, James V didn't speak it either. His father, James IV, was the last um, the last uh, king of Scotland to speak Gaelic um, uh, fluently. I don't think James knew it, and James V knew any at all, um, and certainly she wouldn't have learned any. Uh, there wouldn't have been a great deal of point because it was only basically spoken in the highlands mm. um and she would have had little contact with people of course she did travel around um uh, james v like his father you know wanted his wife to be seen um by the scots uh and mary um uh, went um initially with him to linlithgow um which had been uh part of margaret tudor's dower um it wasn't actually part of marie's although she was very fond of she shared her mother-in-law's um, uh, pleasure in Linlithgow Palace, um, which is to the slightly to the west of Edinburgh, and it, it stands on a sea lock, uh, and it's, it's a wonderful ruin now um, in in the town of Linlithgow. Um, but it was a very splendid palace in those days, and uh, uh, Marie was obviously well educated um, and tactful woman, and she made all the right noises about how it was just as splendid as any castle she'd ever seen in France, uh, which it may or may not have been. <laughs> it probably stood up pretty well to that test. Um, but no, she she wouldn't have spoken any of of the the native Scottish language. I suppose. Um, in terms of actually communicating with other people in Scotland, um, I don't know whether she learned any Lowland and uh, any Scots or not. Margaret Tudor certainly did, but whether Marie did, I don't know, because of course most of the Scottish um elite, the aristocrats, many of them were educated in France and would have spoken French. So there there wouldn't have been a lot of necessity for her to, to do so, but she would have acquired some familiarity with it over the years, I, I think, at any rate. Um, but she um, she settled down quite quickly, um, travelled around. Um, she enjoyed the the um, life of, of a Scottish queen. Uh, she and James um, seem to have had a fairly passionless relationship, actually. Um, there doesn't seem to have been a great deal of warmth on either side. And I was recently discussing, actually, with a Scottish historian. Um, of course, um, Marie discovered 
um, as Madeline would have done if she'd stayed there longer in, uh, long enough, and certainly as Margaret Tudor had done with James IV, that that was already a substantial family of illegitimate children by various mistresses scattered around in different Scottish castles. Uh, she seems to have um, accepted this with reasonable equanimity. And although it's been said that James V continued his philandering, which certainly matched, if not exceeded, that of his father, after his marriage to Mary of Guise. Um, it has been pointed out to me recently that as far as we know, he had no further illegitimate children after his marriage to her, um, which is interesting, I think. I mean, at least he, he seems not to have wanted um, to put her in the embarrassing position of having to acknowledge bastards while she was his wife, you know, at any rate. So uh, um, eventually, after she'd been there about a year, uh, Marie gave birth to her elder child, who was a son, Prince James. Uh, uh, and this was greeted with wild enthusiasm and great pleasure by her husband, as you can imagine. And the following year, she had another son, Robert. Uh, so uh, at that stage, James V of Scotland had two heirs, while his um, uncle in in England, Henry VIII, had just managed one heir in, in legitimate heir in the October of 1537. So uh, at that stage, the Scots were still well ahead when it came to uh, male heirs. But um, very sadly, um, the following, in, shortly after little Prince Robert was born, his brother fell ill. And the two children, who were not together, um, incidentally, died literally within a day of each other, leaving their parents absolutely prostrate with grief um, and, and just general bewilderment. And at this point, Margaret Tudor, who got on very well with her second daughter-in-law, incidentally, I mean, Marie was also clever enough to realise that she would gain a great deal on a personal level by befriending her mother-in-law because Margaret Tudor had had a terrible time for many, many years. And she was and had been back at court for, for some years at that time. Uh, but nevertheless, the two women got on very well and shared um, quite a lot of interests. And Margaret certainly spoke French um, and would have been able to communicate quite well with her with her daughter-in-law. Uh, and Marie seems to have almost gone out of her way to, to sort of um, uh, pay due attention and almost homage, if you like, um, to this woman who had had a, a dreadful time as as queen consort after the death of James the uh, Fourth. And and Margaret Tudor's I mean last service to her son, to whom she had devoted her her life actually um, after his father was killed at the Battle of Flodden. Her last service was to, to try and comfort this, this grieving couple. And Margaret died in the October of, of 1541. And of course, a, a year, just, just over a year after that, um, Mary of Guise gave birth in fierce, um, firstly cold early December weather with, with um, huge snowdrifts and everything. She gave birth at Lin Linlithgow, which she uh, had always enjoyed as a place but to a daughter, not to a son. And that daughter was Mary, Queen of Scots. And of course, six days later, James V died. Is there any truth to the quote of what James said upon his deathbed? Um, I suspect not. And I think most um, Scottish historians would agree uh, James was dying um, probably of dysentery or cholera, one or the other, which he picked up during the uh, disastrous for the Scots campaign of Solway Moss, which had been fought in, in November 1541. Uh, and, and he'd lost many of his nobility, not as many as James IV, his father had lost at Flodden, but he'd lost a lot of um, leading uh, Scottish supporters um, in the swirling waters and bogs of the River Esk in, in on the, the Anglo-Scottish border. And uh, he had and James V, unlike his father, had not taken part in the battle. He had at least learned something from his father's example. He had watched it from a distance. But there'd been a lot of ill health in the army. I mean, campaigning late into November um, in those days was unusual. Um, and the possibility for the spread of disease was rife. And uh, a couple of James's closest friends amongst the nobility had died. And it seems fairly likely that he'd picked up um, something, either dysentery or cholera, um, from uh, being so close to his army at the time. 
Uh, and when he went, he wasn't immediately ill. He went back to Edinburgh and undertook some governmental business there. But by within a few days after his daughter's birth, he had actually seen Mary of Guise at Linlithgow before her daughter was born. I think it was fortunate that he didn't um, uh, infect either the unborn child or her mother or both of them, you know, with, with um, what was shortly to kill him. But he retired eventually um, to Falkland Palace in, in Fife. Um, and it became obvious to him, as well as everyone else, that he was dying. And I've always thought, I mean, if you're if you're dying of a, a horrible disease, are you really going to come up with a pithy statement like, it can we, alas, and it'll gang we, alas? I don't think that that's very likely. Uh, and I don't think this idea that he'd said that, um, which is a reference to the Maid of Norway, incidentally, um, and quite why he thought that the Scottish... Um, uh, throne came with the maid of Norway, I don't know, because of course the Scots had kings that went back into the high Middle Ages and beyond. Um, but that, that was what the reference was to. It doesn't appear in any of the Scottish chronicles until well into the latter part of the um, 16th century. So I think it's extremely unlikely that he said anything of that sort. In fact, he, it is said that he dictated and signed a notarial instrument in which he nominated a council to look after his daughter. Um, consisting of his um, Chancellor, Archbishop David Beaton, his wife, uh, Mary of Guise, and a number of other noblemen. But there is, it was um, suspicion at the time, and it has been voiced subsequently, actually, by historians, that, that he was too ill even to do that. He might just have been able to scratch a signature, perhaps, but not much more than that. And that this whole particular document, which... Um, spelled out the arrangements for Mary, Queen of Scots minority, was actually forged by David Beaton himself. But I don't know that, I, I, I don't think there's, ever, there's any actual sort of physical proof of that. It's just a very strong suspicion on the part of various people. And it began with contemporaries, you know, right at the time. Though Beaton was extremely unpopular, as were many leading Scottish noblemen. But uh, um, so, yes, I mean, Mary of Guise was then left. Um, a widow with a very small daughter um, at a time when her country was under threat of, of um, further invasion from the English. In fact, um, John Dudley, who was related to become Duke of Northumberland and who was the military English commander in, in the north at the time, wrote to Henry VIII saying, um, I'm paraphrasing this, but that he thought it would be unjustifiable and unseemly to make war on a, a woman who'd just given birth and who had a, a suckling child. Well, at least there were some morals there. Yes, there were. I, think, I, know, I mean, also, there was the entirely practical point of view that, that um, uh, fighting well into the winter. Uh, and the, in fact, the, the messenger who brought the news of Mary, Queen of Scots' birth south from Linlithgow over the border um, into berwick on tweed it took him six days to get through the snowdrifts in what should have been, you know, no more than a couple of days' ride. So... Uh, I, I mean, it, it was a very dismal time, um, just as dismal in many respects um, as what happened to the Scots after Flodden. And there hadn't been the huge loss of life. Um, and although they'd lost some of their leading men who were taken prisoners, they weren't actually killed. And of course, Henry VIII later wanted to make advantageous swaps for them, um, which which he did. Uh, but it, it was a, a, a dismal start to the, the life of Mary, Queen of Scots. And her her mother, um, you know, left a, a widow at a, at a young age. She was still only in her mid-20s, um, was faced with an extremely difficult um, situation. And of course, she stayed in Scotland for the rest of her life. And now a word from our sponsor. History has really made Marie out to be a strong and proud woman, do we know how she reacted when she learned of James's death? Was she scared or did she feel empowered? Uh, we don't know how she reacted. Um, we, we have no idea. Um, I, I think it's unlikely that she was grief stricken or at least would have, have demonstrated that. She must have had to do some fairly quick thinking about how she would safeguard her position and that of her daughter. I mean, whose very survival must have been in doubt. I mean, the, the English, first of all, claimed that Mary was a very weak baby. But by the time um, Sir Ralph Sadler, sent north eventually by Henry VIII as his envoy, saw 
um, the infant Mary, he reported that she was a, you know, a healthy looking, um, even rather sort of buxom little girl. I think Mary of Guise um, played an extremely clever hand. Um, she was a woman of great intelligence and, and considerable sort of political nous. And maybe one of the lessons she had learned from her her um, her mother-in-law, Margaret Tudor, was that you may not be able to get or hold on to the Regency. Perhaps that isn't even what you should aim for in these circumstances, but you must keep physical control of your child. And that is what Mary of Guise did. Um, uh, she, uh, of course, batted away all sorts of suitors because um, she was a highly um, eligible young widow, again, as you can imagine, uh, and kept Mary close to her for um, nearly five years until the continued cross-border warfare between England and Scotland, which are known rather romantically subsequently as the rough wooings. They weren't very romantic, though they certainly were very rough, um, until, you know, the whole of Scottish stability seemed to her so dubious um, that she decided she must get her daughter away. Uh, and Henry II of France, for, for, of course, reasons of his own, was, was quite keen to have a Scottish queen um, grow up at his court and marry his eldest son. And so um, little Mary, Queen of Scots, left from Dunbarton in 1548. Um, uh, her little flotilla evaded um, English ships who were expected to try and stop her because, of course, Henry VIII had wanted her to marry Edward VI, um, it's interesting to speculate what on earth kind of marriage it might have been had Edward survived and had Mary actually married him. I don't think they would have got on very well myself. Um, I can't imagine any wife getting on very well with Edward VI, really. <laughs> but, uh, of course, it, it it never happened. And Mary, Queen of Scots, did grow up in France, but her mother stayed behind in Scotland. How unusual was it that a monarch, regardless if it was a minor or not, would leave their country for their own safety to grow up? Well, it had happened before. It wasn't necessarily a very happy precedent. I mean, in J the first James the first, uh, you know, James the first Stuart, not James the sixth and first, but the, the first James the first of Scotland, if you like, um, had um, uh, been sent to France by his father at the beginning of the fifteenth century, but he was intercepted by the English in the North Sea and grew up as a hostage to Henry V uh, in, in London. And that was how he he met Joan Beaufort, his, his, his wife, um, during his time there. Uh, and so it, it, it wasn't unheard of, but it was quite risky. On the other hand, I, I think it was absolutely the right thing for Mary of Guise to, to have done, um, because the situation in Scotland was unstable anyhow, uh, and the English, the war with the English merely made it worse. And Mary of Guise would have liked to have been regent, of course, but she had to wait a very long time until the mid-1550s before she actually uh, became uh, regent. And, and the regency, therefore, passed to Mary's Queen of Scots cousin, um, uh, James Hamilton, um, the Earl of Arran, and eventually he was bought off by the French uh, and accepted uh, a, a dukedom in France. He didn't go there, um, but he, he accepted the dukedom and the lands that came with it in return for Mary of Guise actually acquiring the regency in the mid 1550s. Uh, but she had held on all that time. Um, and she, I think, genuinely believed that her daughter was safer and would have a better chance to um, eventually become, you know, Queen Regnant of Scotland um, when she reached the age of her majority um, by having her safely away from Scotland itself. But it, it was fairly unusual. I mean, I'm trying to think, apart from James I, Stuart, I, I don't know immediately of any other examples of anyone uh, in, in childhood being sent abroad like that as, as a monarch. But you have to remember, I think it's something that most people don't realise, I mean, most of the English don't realise either, um, that uh, the Stuarts were a well-established dynasty. Um, they had been on the throne since the, the late 14th century. Um, they had um, 
uh, successful diplomatic relations with Northern Europe and with France and with the papacy as well. Uh, they were, um, uh, the dynasty itself had survived with, um, with monarchs who came to the throne as minors all the time between, um, I'm trying to think when it is, it's, it's about 1402. Uh, no, actually, maybe 1405, but it's right at the beginning of the 15th century. Anyhow, until Charles the, the I became King of Scotland and England um, in 1625. Uh, and although um, we tend to be horrified and critical of the Scottish nobility, who were an immensely quarrelsome lot, it says a great deal, I think, for their determination to keep their country uh, on the right track and, and to govern it honorably and for it to survive that that the Stuart dynasty survived all that time with with children for many many years as its reigning monarch right the Stuart dynasty didn't begin when James the James the sixth became James the first of England there's so much fascinating history in Scotland all on its own that I think sometimes especially those who are so fascinated in the Tudors forget to look at that northern neighbor and their they, history. They do, and, and you miss a lot if you do. Uh, I mean, the reason I wrote my earlier book, Crown of Thistles, which is about Mary, Queen of Scots, and her father and grandfather, um, is that uh, apart from Mary, Queen of Scots, and Robert Bruce at Bannockburn, I realised that I didn't actually know anything about Scottish history. And that is true of most English people and, and regrettably these days, probably quite a few Scots, um, <laughs> though they, they they are taught more in their schools about their, their history um, than I think um, people necessarily understand. But uh, I remember being in France some years ago and telling um, the um, proprietor of the sheet that we were renting that I was writing this book on on Mary Queen of Scots and her backstory as it were uh, and and uh, how it, it covered quite a lot of the history of Scotland he, he said to me c'est une histoire très troublée and you can say that again because it is a very troubled history <laughs> <laughs> so, so true. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of Marie's life. What did she die from? How old was she when she died? She was in her, um, well, she was, I'm trying to remember, she was born in 1515 and she died in 1561. Um, so she was, um, uh, what is that? I'm not something. good at these sort of things. <laughs> on a bit, but she would have been in her late 40s, I guess, yeah. early 50s at the most. Uh, and she, yeah. Uh, she appears to have, have died of what we nowadays would call congestive heart failure. I think she put on a lot of weight um, uh, and she they described it as dropsy at the time, which is what we would call congestive heart failure now, I think. And she she was unwell for some months. I mean, she had had the most difficult, I think, and in many respects, tragic life, just as tragic as her daughters, though, you know, from a different perspective. Uh, and she had written to um, one of her brothers, the Cardinal of Lorraine, um, in, in the few years before she died, saying, essentially, you have no idea how difficult it is to govern a small nation like this and bring it to, you know, maturity and adulthood. Uh, and that is what she had devoted her life to. And of course, in the end, it did all fall apart because the rise of Protestantism in Scotland, which had been very slow and, and years behind that in England, um, eventually, in the, the late 1550s, a group of Scottish nobles who were known as the Lords of the Congregation and who were amongst whom was James Stuart, Earl of Murray, who was the um, much elder half brother of Mary, Queen of Scots, it essentially sided with England, giving uh, Elizabeth, who hadn't been on the throne very long then, an opportunity to um, play a direct role in Scottish politics. And there had been, I think, over many years, some disquiet about the role of France in Scotland. I mean, the, the, the Scots felt that they were either under the thumb of one country or the other. And many of their leading men took the decision that their um, uh, situation would be better if they threw in their lot with England and with William Cecil and, 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 and with Elizabeth. So Mary of Guise died knowing that there had been this major rebellion um, religious rebellion but but also you know a, a constitutional one as well against her rule um she didn't know of course that her daughter's husband francis ii of france would die you know within a year of her own death 
um, meaning that Mary, Queen of Scots, had little alternative other than than to come back to to Scotland and and to try and rule it. So I uh, I think it 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 must have been a demanding and frustrating life. I mean, it's not surprising that she fell ill, but then. Um, you know, uh, being in your 50s wasn't a bad age for men or women in those days. Uh, and she um, she eventually, I mean, in, in towards the end, she couldn't eat or, or sleep. Um, she stayed up in a chair and she died during the night with the Earl of Argyll and James Murray, um, uh, James Earl of Murray beside her. Um, and she asked them, of course, to look after and be good to her daughter, um, which is <laughs> Argyle was in his way. Murray definitely wasn't. Um, and so I, I think it's a very sad life. And she lay um, in her lead coffin for quite a long time before it was eventually taken back to, to France um, uh, to a convent where her sister was the, the abbess. But the um, the tomb um, was destroyed in the French Revolution, as were many others, of course. Um, so uh, it, it is very sad. You know, none of these um, monarchs, I'm trying to think where James V is buried, actually. And I'm afraid off the top of my head, I don't remember, but it, probably at Holyrood, I would think. But I might be wrong about that. You'll probably get people phoning in saying I am wrong. <laughs> I mean, it was certainly Margaret Tudor's um, tomb was defaced during this religious uprising at the end of the, the um, 1550s. James IV, her husband, has no known resting place. Um, uh, and, and neither does uh, Mary of Guise. But of course, Mary, Queen of Scots, does and is in many respects very ironically buried in Westminster Abbey. That does seem a little ironic. <laughs> it is. Yes, it is. Well, today we've been talking about Madeleine of Valois and Marie of Guise. Dr. Porter, what would you like our listeners or maybe history in general to really remember them by? I think Madeleine is, is a tragic example of how, you know, someone who should have been nurtured and cared for um, in what was always going to be, you know, a fatal illness um, through sort of diplomatic manoeuvrings and perhaps her, her own ambition. And there's nothing wrong with having an ambition when you're 16 to be a queen after all. But her tenure was so brief um, that, that her life is forgotten. And um, Mary of Guise, I think, has only more recently been realised for the um, and truthfully very impressive woman that she was, uh, and quite a likeable woman in many respects, I think, as well. But someone who pursued single-mindedly, um, as she thought, um, the the well-being of her child, as her mother-in-law, Margaret Tudor, had done. Um, and Mary of Guise is one of a number of uh, really important political figures in the 16th century who, who were women and who I think have only more recently, you know, perhaps in the last 30 years or so, been um, given their due for who they were, what, what they endured and what they actually achieved. Well, if you enjoyed this conversation today as much as I did, Dr. Linda Porter has a plethora of books. Okay, there might be a small exaggeration, but you have written a lot of <laughs> well, I've got I've got six. Uh, wait a minute, five. Even <laughs> I've, I've just finished writing the six, but I and mean, it won't be published for a while. But yes, there, there are five. Yeah. Well, and they're all so wonderfully researched and beautifully written. I really would love it if you listeners go check out her books, buy some of them, oh. because I guarantee you're going to learn something. Oh, thank you very much. I, I should just point out um, before you go, Rebecca, that my most recent book, which is on Charles II's mistresses, was never actually published in the United States. I mean, don't ask me why. I find this quite extraordinary. It was extremely successful over here. So, uh, but the others are Amer available. Um, the first, um, the first four of them in the in in the U.S. Um, often under different titles, but it is the same book. I will include links in the show notes so that everybody okay, can. Okay, that's read. great. Well, it's been great talking to you, Rebecca, again. You too. Thank you so much for coming on today and teaching us about these two French women who became Scottish queens. Dr. Linda Porter, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook 
Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.